Welcome back, boys and ghouls, for a Halloween-themed episode of Light the Fuse. <laughs> Why is this Halloween-themed? Oh, the wait a minute. No, this it's is not like ha- New Year's-themed. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Did I just become the Crypt Keeper? I think I did. Sorry. Anyway, we're um, back. Charles. That's on my Christmas list, the, the Tales from the Crypt DVD box set. I'm hoping somebody gets it for me. It's the only place it's available is a DVD box set. Yeah. I cherish that box set. I need it. It's great. Um, Charles, how you doing? You excited to be back here with uh, Christopher McQuarrie? I'm great. I I mean, this is I, I'm so happy that we did this, and that I'm so I, it's crazy we were able to coordinate and make this chat happen with Christopher McCory. And of course, a gigantic thank you to him for so many reasons. For, he's been so generous with us over the years, and to have him make time for this, uh, he really is uh, just. I mean, he he really cares about the fans and 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 wanting to connect with that, with all of you and and wanting these movies to connect with you. And I just I just appreciate him so much. This is just an amazing chat, and it was so cool to talk to him. Like you said before, that we've never really talked with him about Jack Reacher, on or off the air. And so it was like, oh, this is like a really cool conversation to have. And uh, yeah, it, we it, there was so much, we didn't even get. I had a long list of things to talk about. We didn't even get to half of them relating to this movie. Like I, we didn't even get to talk about the casting of, of Werner Herzog. I know, I know. I think I think we will. To me, this was an in, an opening salvo for future Jack Reacher conversations. Okay, right. Isn't that what you felt? <laughs> Maybe so. At the fifteenth anniversary, we'll talk to him again. Fifteenth anniversary, we'll just whenever, <laughs> whenever we 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 need a, a little Reacher, little spice of Reacher, we'll we'll yeah. talk to him. But maybe we can sneak it in. Maybe we can sneak it in while we're talking about Mission Impossible. We can just be like, hey, quickly, we got to talk about Werner Herzog because oh my god. And then it'll be a thirty minute conversation. I, wa- I really want to know how that casting came about. I wonder. Actually, I don't. I've never listened to the commentary. Uh, one of our Patreon subscribers, I think it was Jacob, right from uh-huh. uh, from our our upper tier Zoom chat. He brought up that the commentary for Jack Reacher on the Blu-ray is really great, and I have not listened to that, so I need to to listen to that. So, I mean, that's a you guys all out there as well. That's a good thing to check out. Um, I also wanted to. It's the end of the year. I feel like we've had this really amazing year. It's been so fun, and I wanted to actually give you a congratulations, Drew. What on the air surprise you? What because this I you, we didn't even talk about this. I, I've been saving to talk talk to you about this, but the you earned a a, a, a journalistic prize like it was I, the the rap <laughs> the rap earned four top prizes at the L.A. Press Club's National Arts and Entertainment Journalism Awards. Uh, did you go to this? Was it says it was, it was at the go. Sheraton Universal? Yeah, I know it was at the which you know is my favorite hotel in L.A. I know. Yeah, you used to when you lived uh, in Connecticut still, and I was out here. I had moved out to here after, right after college. You would come visit for junkets or publicity stuff or screenings or whatever premieres. Yeah, and you would always stay at the Sheraton Universal, and I would always go over there and meet you and and hang out there at that the it's, hotel. It's really a sad place, but you know, yeah. it's, 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 <laughs> I wasn't there. I'm surprised I wasn't just at the Sheraton Universal. You you know, for just for your own yeah, for my own edification. But <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we I won, I won an award for an article I wrote about uh, Imagineering's move to Florida. Yeah, let me hear. Uh, film reporter Drew Taylor and editor in chief Sharon Waxman shared the trophy in the online hard news film category for Disney Imagineers demand halt of mass move to Florida after Don't Say Gay blow up which judges called a compelling article about how employees at one entertainment company responded with a backlash on one of the divisive cultural issues. So congratulations. This is awesome, man. Well, you know, when you think of hard news, you think of me, obviously. (laughs) And so I really feel like... No, I. That's so cool. Did you you get some kind of trophy or something? Did you get something? I, I do get a physical award, but I haven't picked it up yet. Um, well, you should go do that. Because I never go in the office. But... I yeah, it was a huge surprise. Thank you, Charles, for the shout out. I'm deeply embarrassed, so uh, I appreciate you springing. <laughs> that's this. what I, that's what I love to do. I'm yeah. here to embarrass you. Yeah, but uh, yeah, hopefully more more good articles in the new year. Let's hope. Let's yes. pray. Of course you will. Of course, of course. This is just more great things to come. I also wanted to give a, a shout out to the people who we did a social media tease for before we announced Christopher McCory was going to be on the show. We, we said that we have a special guest coming back. It's a returning guest, and it's an anniversary celebration. And, and I said, we'll give you one shot to guess. And most people did not get it, but there were a few people out there who messaged us and figured it out that to say, we'll give you one shot to guess, one shot is the name of the Jack Reacher novel that the movie is based on. And so I was... Who, who got it? 
Uh, I know Christina got it from our Patreon. Mm. I th- I'm trying to remember who else. I feel bad now. I want to name all the people who got it because there are a couple people on Instagram who got it as well. And oh man, I wish I, I wish I had the names. I, I should have written them down. But I just want to say that uh, yeah, those the, the we had some some clever people out there who caught that. Bunch of Jack Reachers out there, you know. What I mean? <laughs> um, yeah, and so I guess that's that's about it. I think we should get into this uh, this conversation, the conclusion of our conversation with Christopher McCory about about Jack Reacher on the tenth anniversary. But of course, of course, first you need to do your shout outs. Of course, yes, I do. I need to give a shout out to. Jeremy Dillon and his podcast, My Favorite Album, and he's uh, encouraging everybody to listen to his Better Call Saul episodes, as well as John B., Elvis Ripley, and Suchet. And if you want more of us and more of Jeremy Dillon, we have our Best of 2022 episode coming out on My Favorite Album. We'll share it on the Patreon, uh, but that should be out soon. So listen to Jeremy and listen to us and... Listen to Christopher McQuarrie, because we're about to get back into it with the third part of our Jack Reacher discussion. We'll be back right after. Was the utilization of the kind of like, you know, everyday P- Pittsburgh folks, was that always part of the design of that sequence? Or was that another thing that you discovered as you were shooting? Because that's one of the other things that makes that so powerful, I think. And that, the, yeah, that was my initial, that was my initial pitch to Tom and he didn't get it. And he was like, he, he didn't see it. And he was like, I don't really know about that ending. And again, to Tom's credit, it was not it's not something he understood. And it's something I kept saying, this is the end of the scene, it's gonna work. And w- and one night when we were getting ready to shoot the car chase, he said, let's just go out and walk the entire route of the car chase. Now you gotta understand the car chase is not in a contained geography, it's spread all over Pittsburgh. And we went out in a car and would get dropped off at the top of whatever the location was, we would walk through the entire thing. It's Tom Cruise walking around Pittsburgh, you know, 10 o'clock at night. Through, we walked through that tunnel. We walked down every one of those alleys. We walked along all the streets and everything and went and talked through the sequence. And when we got to, when we got to that location, I physicalized it for Tom and he immediately saw it. He said, I get it. I totally understand it. And 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 he and he was he thanked me for taking him through it because it was an idea he didn't he didn't get and didn't he just could it's not it's not that he had, he just couldn't feel it he didn't understand until he saw it physicalized and that and that's the thing once he could visualize it he recognized what it was and it's a very it's to this day it's my it's it's the moment in Reacher that that makes me laugh because there are there are people who who really get that moment. And there are people who absolutely do not get that moment. And they're, you know, they're saying, the, you know, the police are looking for a sniper and why would anybody help this person, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, well, first of all, the police aren't looking for a sniper. They caught him that morning. This is in no way related. And if you have a problem understanding this moment, it says more about you and your relationship with authority. <laughs> <laughs> and I was very careful with the casting. I was very careful with the casting of every single one of those people. They were all cast off of headshots. And I was like, these these are all people. First of all, they're all standing on a bus. Stop. And they're they're all waiting for a bus. And they're all they're they're all people from a certain economic strata of life. And they're all people who are uh, you know, who occupy a very certain place in society. And they're and they're and if anything, they're out for each other than they are for anybody else. Um, and and I just, I it was interesting because it was a moment in the movie that almost wasn't. And for me, it is the, it's the whole purpose for, for having that sequence. Yeah, it's such a wonderful moment. I did want to ask you, because on, on Twitter recently, you described shooting the quarry sequence as, quote, hell on earth. Oh God! Yeah, um, I'm curious what happened there. <laughs> um, so the quarry, uh, we we were struggling to find a location, and 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 that is the beginning. Uh, that's kind of the beginning of my 
choosing locations more for their dramatic uh, their dramatic value than their practicality. Uh, and and first thing you must understand, I do not like inclement weather. I do not like extreme conditions. I my I, my wife refers to me as the great indoorsman. Um, I I'm I'm not a person who seeks that stuff out. With every success I have with those, I push the envelope farther and farther. When you see Dead Reckoning Part One and Two, you will see more inclement weather and extreme conditions and difficult environments. Uh, to the point where now I've kind of developed an addiction to shooting there, not because I like going there, but because of the results that I get. It's what we were talking about before we started recording. What you will not get with green screen, what you will not get in a volume is what John Ford got in The Quiet Man and what Steven Spielberg got in the opening of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And it is visceral, it is real, and it is... And, it, and, it, and there's no other way. To, you got to get dirt under your fingernails. I learned that shooting that sequence. Uh, what you see on screen is fairly controlled. We're shooting in the good weather. Any rain that you're seeing is, is rain that we brought in. In between that was rain, hail, snow, fog. One night we came and there was a fog in the quarry and not anywhere else. Like you were standing up <laughs> above the quarry looking into a bowl of soup. <laughs> and it was dense, dense fog. Uh, there was a moment where it was raining and, and, and because the quarry was impacted dirt from big trucks running over it, it was hard packed soil, but then it had a layer, like a viscous layer of mud that was almost like grease. And it was everywhere and on everything. And it got in your clothes. It got over all the equipment. And I was standing next to my brother wearing rain gear. And my brother, who's a Navy SEAL, is wearing jeans and a nylon jacket. He's just standing <laughs> in just this. And guys are walking by me like with wind and, and you know, and they've got cables, miles of cables covered in this greasy, oily, silty mud and no, and, and uh, all the tents that are around the monitors are being lifted by the wind. And so the crew are just holding them to the ground. It was, it was horrible. And I said to my brother, I have some small feeling of what it must have been like to be Napoleon retreating from Moscow. And my brother looked at me and goes, ah, shut the fuck up. You got a hard road under your feet. <laughs> and years later, uh, Jake Myers, who had been a producer on Jack Reacher and then was a was working on The Revenant. He came in to help The Revenant when they were when they were struggling. It was a very difficult production and they shot it in some of the coldest, most extreme, miserable environments in both hemispheres. They were chasing the snow for a lot of the movie and they ended up in South America at one point. They were on a glacier and the, and a couple of the crew walked by and they had worked on Jack Reacher. And they looked at Jake and one of them said, this is bad, but it's not as bad as that quarry in Jack Reacher. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my fondest memory was the night when Caleb Deschanel came walking out to where we were shooting the scene between Tom and Jai Courtney. And Caleb looked up and he goes, I got to tell you, I've, this rain, I'm not impressed with it. Doesn't look all that great. And I looked at him and I said, this is not our rain, Caleb. <laughs> and, and we hadn't turned the rain on yet it was just we were just standing here he he but he actually like it was raining hard enough that caleb actually thought we were about to roll and then we turned our rain on and that's that's what you ended up seeing in the movie um wow oh my yeah. god amazing uh can we can we talk about the ending briefly to end on this this sure. note because the ending is so fucking good and it sounds like you had a you had a plan for more and then there was another movie made but I don't think it met the standards of this one obviously and I don't know if you can talk maybe a little bit about that um where you think that the sequel did or did not uh, sort of fulfill the prophecy of this one? Um, um, I well, I, the end of the end of ours, and I, I would do it somewhat different. I wouldn't do the ending differently, but I would I would handle one thing differently, which is the 
the love story between Reacher and Helen, which there's a ghost of what I would do now. I, I learned from, oddly enough, I learned from working on Mission Impossible and Top Gun is kind of the culmination of that and changed the way I will make movies forever. That the specifics of plot tend to overwhelm the the importance of emotion and that the more you lean into emotion and away from plot, the more engaging the movie becomes. I was too focused on making the plot make sense, which is, it's a tricky plot to take from a book and turn into a movie, as are many of the plots in Reacher. Reacher, Reacher is a cinematic character in books that are not cinematic and you, you adapt them at your peril. And I looked at all the Reacher books after the fact in terms of what we would do next, where we would depart and why. And so the, 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 the emotional story between Reacher and Helen is kind of half-baked. We really wanted it to feel romantic at the end and we, we contrived a scene where they kissed goodbye and the audience rejected it. And to his credit, Tom was like, they don't want it, take it out. You didn't, you know, we, 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 as much effort as we put into it, we just said, doesn't work, let it go. It's another reason why I love working with Tom. Um, it's, it's that, it's that lesson reiterated. And, and I would, I would say that if I was going to do the movie now, I would build the movie more around a relationship of two people who meet by circumstance, develop a real affection for one another, but can never be together because she can never leave and he can never stay. And, and that's hinted at in the story, but it's not really threaded threaded in. What you're seeing in Reacher is me just sort of the way, if the anything, the way of the gun is a movie where I thought I could make you feel things by telling by by through words. And Reacher, you can see how I learned how to use words more to shape emotion, like when Rosamond goes and tells the story of the victims but that really the images of the victims are what tell that story. And the, the sequencing of those victims is what tells that story. The words are not what tell that story. Uh, I think if the second movie um, struggled with anything was, I, A, I wasn't there, I couldn't be there. I couldn't be there to impart what I had learned. I probably couldn't have articulated what I've learned since um, at, at when they were making it. Uh, and it, you know, it's a, that's a tough book. That's a really, really tough book to, to develop. Um, and it's, it's a tough story. It's a road movie. It's a family movie. And it's a, and it's a movie that doesn't, I, I, I think if you were going to tell that story, you would need to firmly establish who Reacher was in the audience's mind. That story is a departure from Reacher. Reacher wasn't at a place where you could yet depart. You needed to kind of get deeper into Reacher before you could then say, and now this is the one where he's got a family. Um, so I, I think that that could have had a lot to do with it. We wanted to do something very different and something very, very, very gritty and more man with no name and, you know, sort of Reacher as a, uh, as a, as a, as a one man army. And um, and there was there was a really cool book for doing that. Um, Which one? Uh, it was called. I could be wrong. I it was called. Was it sixty one hours? I'm, I, they're all mixed up in my head now. The one that ends with him crushing the guy's head in his hands isn't that the one, isn't that the book that ends um, with him actually? It's the one. It's it's the one where he's in the Midwest and it's human trafficking and yeah, and he's trying to get out of town and he's in he's in the middle of like the you know the the badlands and he and he and and he is a what I loved about it is the movie is very is the, the book rather is is a, is totally agoraphobic. It's it's wide open spaces with nowhere to hide. It's it's the it's the airplane scene in North by Northwest taken to an extreme, and it's it's Americana, but it's dark Americana. It's and it was it it, ha, it was a bleak landscape, and Tom and I were were we were so frustrated by the constraints of PG thirteen, and you're you're making an action movie, and you're making it for 
you know, your primary audience are young males and they're telling you with, with, it's like, we want more, we, we want more ass kicking. We want more, they want a movie that's more brutal and you're, you're equivocating by trying to make it something else. And you saw the, 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 the business woke up suddenly they're, they're, they realized with Deadpool and with Joker that there was a paying audience that would come and support those movies if you if you gave it to them. Um, we were making that argument back in 2012, saying this is just, there's more, there's a bigger audience, there's more to it. And who are you kidding? You're not making Jack Reacher a date movie. It's just not that kind of movie. This is a visceral, hard hitting, you know, when I was growing up, you could go see a hard R movie and, and it would make money. Movies have become somewhat, somewhat equivocated. Movies are about risk mitigation, and 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 as a result, movies don't always. They're not always allowed to figure out what they are. They're not always allowed to be what their best self could be. Uh, and and I just feel Reacher's best self would be a harder hitting, more brutal, antidotal movie. It could be our. Uh, 21st century Dirty Harry. That's really where where we wanted it. Where we wanted to go with it. The business just wasn't ready to embrace that as an idea. We did the best we could within the confines of of PG 13. Now, if I would if I was to do that, I would just I would do that with original material. That's what I did. I brought Tom a movie, which is one we're talking about doing next. Which is like let's just let's take everything we wanted to do in that world and take everything we learned from Top Gun and all the mission movies and put it into something more, more visceral and real and gnarly, just kick some ass. He, that's the great thing. It's, you know, Tom is not, Tom, and when I brought it to Tom, I presented it to him, it was, and it's brutal and it's, it's violent. And he did the same thing that he did with me on Valkyrie where he, he said, you need more money to make this movie. And I heard, you need to compromise what this movie is. I was waiting for Tom to tell me, you know, I'm Tom Cruise, I gotta kill Hitler. And I was like, no, we don't wanna compromise. He said, guys, you're, you're blowing up the 10th Panzer Division in the first 10 minutes of the movie. You need more money. It's a big budget film. And I said, well, what's the compromise? He said, there is no compromise. You're just gonna make this movie for the largest audience possible. Because you're, you're, you're going to make it for this much money. It's got to make this much money. You need to make it for the largest audience possible. We're going to make this movie as accessible as we can without changing the fundamental story. So he didn't shy away from the fact that everybody in Valkyrie gets killed in the end, that they fail to kill Hitler. That the, It's how to give that ending hope, how to make that ending cinematic and satisfying and rewarding. That's what Tom does. So I brought him this very, very dark, violent movie. And he said, yeah, that's great. How do we make it so that this is not punishing, that the audience is carried along? Don't change the violence. But here's how you do it in such a way that the violence, that the audience is not rejecting the violence, the audience is leaning in. Uh, and he had a very simple formula for doing it. And it was brilliant. Uh, and, it, and it made the story that much better without my ever having to compromise on the stuff I wanted to do, which was just really, you know, was to make a hard R movie. That's what you see when you're seeing the process with Tom. And it's, it's interesting, I listen to it now, where you, you hear people say, oh, you know, Top Gun Maverick is the Tom Cruise show. Right, it's all it's it's all about Tom Cruise. No, it's all about the protagonist, who happens to be played by Tom Cruise. And when you're fed an endless diet of ensemble movies, you forget what is so viscerally engaging about a movie about one person from that one person's point of view, and how everything and you are allowed to invest in that person's story and to become that person. That is narrative that goes all the way back to the oldest known stories. That's, that's what it is. That's what we're doing. That's what we're all about. And you see where, you can see where movies work when they lean into that narrative. And you can see where movies struggle when they lean away from it. Doesn't mean they're not less successful. It doesn't mean they're better or worse. 
the, the, to us, what makes a story the most engaging is tell whatever story you want, tell it in a way that the audience is pulled in. Tell it in a way that the audience is sucked into it and invested in it, whatever the content of that story is. Reacher is really for us the beginning of that journey. Wow, what a perfect way to end this chat with us. Thank you so much for joining us once again, Christopher McQuarrie. I know you have much better things to be doing, but uh, we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Good, good to hear you hear from you both. And I know, you, you, are you both in London right now? No, just me. Charles is uh, suffering in LA. It's three thirty almost, so that's why we have oh, to. Oh my God, Charles, that is that is commitment, my friend. But of course. <laughs> After the story I after the story I told you about the car chase, you really don't have <laughs> And that's it. Wow. We had to say goodbye to Christopher McQuarrie once again. So, so we we wrapped up at I think it was 3.30 a.m. L.A. time. <laughs> That's what it was for me. I think it was midday for you and, and McCory. He was in South Africa and you were in London. Yes. So I think he was a couple of hours ahead of you, too. Yeah. But you guys were like, it was like midday for you on Sunday. For me, it was like almost 4 a.m. Yeah. on a Saturday night while we were recording this. But it was worth it, of course. The, the dedication, Charles, is just... <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> well, we we got an email from McCory. I think it was at I don't know. It was after midnight my time, and he was like, "Hey, I can do this recording pretty pretty soon in a few minutes if you want." I'm just packing my bags. He was, they were moving for, to some other film location or something, and I was like, "Uh, yeah, let's just do it. Fuck it." Yeah, I, so, think, it was, I, think, I, I, I think you texted me at like 9 a.m. England time, and we're like, "Can you get on?" So that would be one, that would be 1 a.m. LA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, "You want to do this right now?" I don't. I but totally worth it it's like fuck it uh, and I mean I would have loved to see them do that sequel set in the Midwest I think he said it's like the the crop duster scene in North by Northwest taken to an extreme I want that give me that inject that into my veins please well it was also interesting just hearing the kind of like hard R version that they were going for especially in light of things like Joker and Logan which have have channeled that hard R right and been hugely successful so and and now, speaking of which, it sounds like they're going to do an original movie in that vein. Yes, that's got to be that's got to be the same one he talked about with us in the 200th episode, yes. right? Like he said, it was he said it was gnarlier than anything Cruz had done. And then in this interview, he used the word gnarly again. Yes. So yes, man, give it I, to us. Uh, give it. Give it. <laughs> Gimme. Yeah, that when he said that, it was that get, that meme of the guy outside the window with the shirt that says "sickos." And he's going, <laughs> that was, that's us. <laughs> that was us yeah, on the yeah. Zoom call. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, sounds great. Yeah. It was also also interesting to hear him say he do the in, he do the ending differently, or at least his general approach to the connection with Rosamund Pike's story. Right. Like now, learning everything he's learned over the last ten years, he's saying he would approach. I think he was saying he would approach their relationship differently, and then that would that would change the ending as well. Right. And that's really interesting to think about. I wonder what that would have looked like. But I mean, it works. The movie works. It's it's great. Um, it's just it's amazing how open he is about how he's learning along the way and 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 applying that to each movie that he makes. It's, it's such a cool uh, thing that he shares that with. Yeah, everybody. I mean, it's <laughs> it's such a hugely important movie in his career too, right? Because it's the first time he directed since. Way the gun, it is clearly established his relationship with Cruz going forward. Yeah. It got him the Rogue Nation job and it changed his life. So, you know, as much as people want to not talk about Jack Reacher or maybe belittle its significance, it is a hugely important movie. Yeah. Um, and well, didn't he say too that it was like the first time it was just him and Cruz collaborating? Right, right, exactly. Because before there was always another element because. You know, with uh, with Valkyrie, Brian Singer's directing, and with Ghost Protocol, Brad Bird's directing, and this time it's just McCory as writer director and Cruz as producer star, and they're working together, and that's where this real tight knit relationship really started. God bless it, because we have <laughs> we have benefited yeah. hugely from that partnership. Yeah, I wanted to say also for everybody to check out our interview with Mark Stockinger. This is uh he was a sound uh, sound designer, I think, sound editor, sound mixer. One or two of those things. He, amazing sound guy. He he did uh, 
which which of the John Wick movie? He did a John Wick movie and he did a Mission Impossible movie, but he's episodes 142 and 143. And in episode 143, he talks a little bit about the sound of Jack Reacher because he also worked on Jack Reacher. How did you remember that? How did I remember that? Yeah. I've, I've just got an encyclopedic knowledge of what we've done on this show. <laughs> I just I keep track, man. Amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Now, I think... I think I, I to, to be fair, I think I did for whatever reason go back to the Stockinger episode in the last few months, and it reminded me. And I and I came across that he had we had talked to him about Jack Reacher because I was I was looking at it for something else. I can't remember what it was, but it was. Oh, so, you know what? Because we I can do a little tease here. We talked to a, another sound guy, a very awesome sound guy. Uh, should we say who we talked to? Yeah, go ahead. Tee it up, bitch. So in January, you'll be getting this interview. In a, in a few weeks, we got uh, James Mather coming on the show. He did the sound for Rogue Nation and for Fallout. He And he also did uh, Top Gun Maverick as well. And so we talked to him about, about that as well. So uh, that was the reason why he was asking us how our interviews go. And then I was like, well, you know, what do we talk about? Because he was a little curious about what our show is. And so I went. that's, that's what got me back and looked because I went back and looked at the Gary Rydstrom episode and the Mark Stockinger episode. And I sent those to him to be like, hey, these are other sound guys we've talked to. And uh, this is give, to give you an idea of what our interviews are like. So that's how I came across Stockinger. But anyway... All that to say, check out episode 143 if you want to hear Mark Stockinger talk about some of the awesome... He tells a great story about the sound uh, in the quarry at the end of Jack Reacher. And, and then they like shot up this Mercedes. And uh, yeah, it's really funny. Anyway. Boy, who would have thought that uh, that quarry would have been so uh, troublesome? I know. Yeah. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> anyway. Uh, what else? You have shout outs to go give, Charles. I do, yeah. I, I got to give a special thank you to Ben Wright and Thomas Victorio. Thank you to Ben and Thomas for making this episode possible. I also want to credit our editor and mixer, Luke Burson, and our music composer, Kevin Blumenfeld, and our intern, Amber Cohen. Uh, we're, she's helping us get that Discord set up for our Patreon subscribers. Speaking of which, sign up for our Patreon, patreon.com slash light the fuse. We do bonus episodes every week. There's so many great uh, perks you get for signing up at the Patreon, and we do upper tier levels as well, where we do a monthly chat. And um, yeah, go, get a shirt or a magnet or a sticker or whatever from our store, T Public store. That's tpublic.com slash user slash light the fuse pod. Also, check out our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. If you go to the episode guide, you'll see great show notes for all of our episodes. There also is a link to our T Public store in there under the merch tab. Anything else, Drew? Yeah, I just want to remind people to like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And follow us for at least the time being on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod. And be sure to come back next week. We have a great uh, revisiting episode. And then we've got some brand new shows coming up that are a lot of fun. And obviously, you know, looking ahead to 2023, we're going to have a big year. And uh, cannot wait to... Get into the lead up of Dead Reckoning Part One with you, Charles. You ready to go on this journey? Oh yeah, and and along the way, we might also be stopping in. Uh, we might have a little stop to make with uh with with Light the Wick as well. Yeah, because we've got a John Wick movie coming out in March, so we'll see if we can get somebody from John Wick to talk to us as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we annoyed those guys sufficiently a couple of years ago, but <laughs> you know, just as John Wick says, he's thinking he's back. We're thinking we're back too. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be a fun it's going to be a fun one. Looking forward to it. Um, and we just have to thank all of you guys for listening. And we'll be back next week. <laughs>Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.